Hello everyone! Welcome to Invested Lifestyle. Today we have a very special guest. He's an MLM expert. We're going to talk about MLMs and why we need your help. Thank you very much and thanks for inviting me to uh, be on with you. Um, I've enjoyed exchanging information with you earlier as well. Um, so my name is Bill Keep. Uh, I have a PhD in marketing uh, and I have been involved uh, in uh, looking at and analyzing and criticizing the multi-level marketing industry since the mid-1990s. Um, I have been involved in federal and state court cases against multi-level marketing companies. I've been involved in private cases against multi-level marketing companies. In two cases, uh, they were criminal uh, uh, prosecutions in, in that, that um, people actually went to jail uh, uh, as a result. Um, I was involved at, in a case with the Security Exchange Commission, which was the largest pyramid scheme case they had ever prosecuted at the time. Um, I was involved in a case between Procter & Gamble and Amway. I, I, I'm currently in two private cases. Um, and uh, in the early uh, 2000s, in fact, just about exactly 20 years ago, uh, I co-authored uh, an academic paper with the then senior economist at the Federal Trade Commission um, on how to tell the difference between a multi-level marketing company, a legal multi-level marketing company, and a pyramid scheme. This is the first academic paper that ever proposed an approach to that problem. Um, and uh, I continued to work on issues and cases co-authored a second paper with the gentleman, Dr. Peter Vandernet, who's actually quite famous, his efforts to help the prosecution of MLM style pyramid schemes. I'm in the movie uh, Betting on Zero, if you've ever seen that, which is the movie about Bill Ackman's short position against Herbalife. In 2016, ESPN did an expose on a company called Advocare. Um, I'm in that expose. You can find it on Google. And three years later, the Federal Trade Commission accused the Advocare of being a pyramid scheme, and uh, the company really did not put up much defense and had to walk away from their MLM model. So uh, I've been involved in uh, looking at MLMs uh, for a very long time. Um, I'm also, uh, I've been a full-time professor. I was the dean of a business school for nine years. I was the, the provost vice president of academic affairs for two years. And now I'm back in the classroom um, and I'll be, I'll wrap up my, clear, my career as a professor. Um, still um, working on this issue of multi-level marketing. Um, last year, um, I hosted, my school hosted, uh, along with the cooperation of a host school in Ireland, uh, a conference, an international conference on multi-level marketing and consumer protection. Our keynote speaker was FTC Commissioner Phillips. We had a current and former um, people from the FTC participate. We had regulators from Ireland and Italy and um, Canada. We had the prosecutors from the state of Washington that prosecuted the MLM LuLaRoe. We had other experts and we will be doing another conference. Uh, so I'm actively involved and would like to encourage people uh, to inform themselves about this issue and the related problems that come with uh, the MLM model. An extensive body of work. You've been studying MLM for decades. <laughs> yes, decades. I, have. I just want to emphasize too. You are one of one of the MLM experts that really didn't say that all MLMs are are scams because you're an academic and you need. The, the data, right? You, you won't say anything that is not supported by hard evidence and data. That's you? correct. And I really appreciate you uh, mm -hmm. saying it that way. Um, this is an industry that it claims to be open, but is actually very uh, closed. It's very hard to get good information on the industry. The information that they put out is often not, uh, you can't verify it independently. Uh, and so we are concerned about the lack of transparency in this industry, particularly since uh, one of its first messages out will be telling people 
that they have all the information they need, that this is a very, very ethical business, that they give money to the community or to charity, all of these sort of niceties that they attach to the model um, doesn't tell you really what's going on. Exactly. And um, I'm so honored to have you. Earlier, I also had Bob Fitzpatrick as mm -hmm. a guest because I think that it will bring more education and knowledge to the Filipino people. Because when they when they have their trainings in, in MLMs, everybody's saying that every, everyone that says something bad about MLMs are just dream stealers, people who entered an MLM and was not successful, so we're losers, and people who are jealous <laughs> of the people in MLMs. But here you are, and um, Bob, and you are approaching this in like a data-driven perspective. Clearly, you've been studying this. You are an expert in retailing, right, and business. They, they can't really bring it on to us that we don't know anything. Yeah, I probably have read more um, articles and looked at more data about MLMs than most people who are in MLMs. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are facts or good data that we have, um, for example, that shows that, um, that there is a high churn rate in an, in an MLM. Uh, and th they will tell you that there's a high churn rate um, because people quit and people uh -huh. give up, right? But um, there's a, a, an underlying problem there. And that is that the success rate that we, we can see um, in long-term MLMs uh, hasn't changed very much at all. In other words, uh, why is it that um, more people aren't successful over time. Why haven't why haven't MLMs learned how to help their people be more successful over time? Why is the supposed training that they give to people hasn't been effective? Why do we continue to see the same people at the top? And so we these are things that we can um, actually um, verify. Uh, and so the idea is if we know, if I know, if I'm sitting from the MLM's perspective. And I know that there's a high probability that eventually you will leave. Um, my best strategy is to get you to stay as long as you can, as long as I can. So I'm going to try to discourage you from listening to anyone negative. I'm trying, I will discourage you from uh, quitting because you aren't making any money or because your expenses are actually greater than your income uh, from the MLM. I'm going to discourage you from taking that view and I'm going to encourage you to think that just around the corner, just in a few more months, uh, that there's success uh, waiting for you. Um, now, in the end, we know from the data that you will end up quitting um, and you will end up being financially worse off. Uh, so, uh, but from my perspective, because the MLM has a required purchasing uh, part of the uh, opportunity, um, I'm going to be making money off of you for as long as you are trying. So the MLMs are, are incentivized to keep the distributors trying and buying. And anything that starts to unravel that uh, friends and relatives warning people even spouses uh, any data that uh, is negative towards that um, the mlm will either deny or suggest that you not look at that or will tell you another story about someone who succeeded yeah that's a good point point. and by the way everything that the uh, bill study everything that he referenced i will put it in the description below you want to read it um me i'm i i i love reading about court cases because everything is public especially with, with regards to mlms so mm -hmm. if you're on the fence yeah it, it's good that uh you read it and you'll see it's almost the same like the cases that that the ftc already uh won or settled <laughs> I watched your interview with uh, the financial diet and you said like 
every single MLM that the FTC prosecuted, they won, except for Amway, of course. That's, yeah. that's exactly right. Uh, since the mid '90s, Amway was in 1979. Since the mid '90s, the FTC has never lost a case, um, and uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, and uh, you know, we aren't sure if the FTC is actually done with Herbalife yet, because Herbalife is on a seven-year monitoring, uh-huh. uh, and uh, so we shall see uh, what happens there. Um, but the interesting thing, for example, in the Herbalife case is. Um, the FTC opens an investigation of Herbalife in part because of Bill Ackman taking a short position mm-hmm. and becoming such a big public fight. Mm-hmm. This is, an, is a company that had already been in existence um, for more than 20 years. And it could not defend itself well enough to avoid a $200 million fine and seven years of monitoring. And I think that says a lot right there. How is it that such a well-established global multi-level marketing company couldn't convince federal regulators that they were doing the right thing? Now, unfortunately for them, the FTC recently finished a multi-year investigation into the company and filed a blistering complaint, walking right up to the line of outright calling it a pyramid scheme. What you're saying is that this company had all the hallmarks of a pyramid scheme. Isn't that right? You know, our focus isn't on the label. The word pyramid does not appear in our complaint. That is true. They were not determined not to have been a pyramid. Think about what she just said there. Not determined not to be a pyramid. How is that not a huge warning sign? So I think that, you know, we have lots of information uh, from those cases that you were referencing. And we also, there are also information... There's also information being generated by people like the folks at Tina.org, the truth and advertising.org, research showing misleading and deceptive statements about products and about product applications and about incomes. And uh, even if we set aside the issue of pyramid schemes for a second, if we only focus on misleading uh, product and earnings claims, uh, which this industry has been dealing with since the late 1940s, um, and so we're really talking about an industry where misleading product claims have been a lingering problem uh, for decades. Uh, and so even if we just don't talk about the pyramid scheme aspect, uh-huh. which we can because there are, there are certainly evidence there, um, but even if we don't talk about the pyramid scheme aspect, we're still talking about an industry uh, that has been plagued, literally plagued uh, by misleading product claims and income claims and those very claims are used to attract and retain distributors people have this misconception that if the mlm is bad or if it's a pyramid scheme why is it still standing because most of the people that are in mlms never had a business before when you register a business they don't really look at your business plan and your model they just like oh i'm gonna start a business but they don't really look at it in detail until they get persecuted or someone like complains right like can you tell me about that Sure. Um, I just registered a business, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, in uh, in the state of Connecticut, I registered an LLC in January, and I all I did is fill out a form and 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 write a check or whatever to make a payment. Um, I didn't have to tell them what I was going to do with this business. I didn't have to tell them any of that stuff. And in the United States, private businesses do not have to make their operations public. Um, The only thing that a private business has to do is to pay taxes on their profits. And so a private business is obligated to uh, fill out their tax report and to pay their taxes. But they do not have to reveal um, how they operate. And so, as you said, it's very complaint driven. Someone would have to complain against them. And, you know, that does happen, of course, sometimes. Um, But... The uh, if we thought if we think that the government is actually vetting businesses to to make sure they're operating um, correctly in a way that is not dishonest or deceptive, um, uh, that's that's a wrong perception. It's a wrong perception here in the United States, and I believe it's a wrong perception everywhere in the world. 
Um, government does not have those resources. Um, the politics in most places um, undermine uh, government efforts uh, to to give oversight. Uh, and uh, so the best we end up getting, and, and, and frankly, you know, I've written critically, uh, you know, negatively about the Federal Trade Commission at times, and I've written positively and complimentary about them. <laughs> so um, the, uh, uh, the reality is that they um, have a lot of things that they're responsible for. Um, and they have limited resources. There's only so many hours in a day. There's only so many people on the payroll that can look at these problems. And so they are selective uh, when they go out and decide to prosecute. Uh, and um, I'm not a part of that conversation, so I don't know exactly what causes them to choose one and not the other. Um, and, you know, we can certainly guess that it was a very public fight about Herbalife that caused them to take a look at Herbalife. Um, but um, I don't know if it was in the case of AdvoCare, what, did the ESPN expose help? I'm not sure, might have. Um, in the case of Vima, um, uh, the, I know that the Tina.org, uh, truthandadvertising.org contacted the FTC directly. Um, I know that there were parent complaints, um, so maybe that helped. Um, and both Vima, by the way, uh, and AdvoCare were award-winning members of the U.S. Direct Selling Association. These companies had received awards from the association. Now, Vima had been in business, I think, about eight or nine years, but AdvoCare had been in business 25 years. So when we think that, you know, and I think, to interrupt myself, I think that the, the, the question you ask is, is a good one because um, the two um, arguments that I've heard at times is um, it can't be a pyramid scheme or can't be operating in a dishonest way because if it was the government would shut it down that's not true the other is that it can't be a pyramid scheme because pyramid schemes uh, are going to fail they're going to you know expand and then they'll uh, you know, exceed the population of the world and therefore it can't be a pyramid scheme if it's lasted a long time that's not true either you know pyramid schemes and ponzi schemes can last for very many years um uh, bernie madoff operated his Ponzi scheme probably for at least 18 years and maybe much longer. Um, you know, the uh, Adv okay, Advocare operated for 25 years. So uh, the, uh, the arguments that you sometimes hear from the industry or from people in the industry who are promoting the model um, don't hold up. Because I know you publicly say that MLM is not your own business. You're not an entrepreneur. I, I tell people like, if you think that this is a business, then try try asking for a small business loan. It clearly states there <laughs> that you can't <laughs> for multi-level marketing. Yeah. If it's a business, yeah. try to sell it. Yeah. yeah right? Yeah, yeah. If I have a business and I don't want to do my business anymore, I can try to sell it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, I can, yeah. Right. I can, if I have a little restaurant or if I have a shop or, or if I'm ma manufacturing something and I'm like, you know what, I'm at the end of my career. I want to, my kids aren't interested. Um, I'm, I'm going to try. This isn't a business you sell. This isn't a business yeah. where you, you control um, the product line or the pricing or the core promotional message. Uh, you can't even control um, how, uh, the the expanse of the business goes in the sense that um, when you recruit people into multi-level marketing, you're actually recruiting your own competitors. Um, yeah. And that is not typical either. So uh, it's funny because the industry used to call uh, uh, participants in multi-level marketing companies uh, salespersons, and they used to call them independent representatives. Um, these are more accurate uh, labels, though some people would say they're not salespeople if they're not really selling very much, uh, uh -huh. but they are representatives. They are agents, the contractual agents uh -huh. of the MLM. Um, they have contractually agreed to certain uh, policies, and in 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 the in exchange for that, um, they. Uh, are allowed to pursue the opportunity as long as they maintain their purchase behavior. And then that includes, um, you know, uh, recruiting others, 
um, and possibly the sale of product to non-distributors. There's a misconception here in the Philippines that the, the, the DSA or the DSA of the Philippines is like a government entity. It's yeah. not, right? <laughs> Yeah. In the United States, and certainly in the Philippines, um, uh, we have what are called trade associations. Okay. Trade associations have, exa- have existed literally for centuries, right? Oh. Um, you know, when Adam Smith was writing about, uh, when he was writing Wealth of Nations back in the, uh, the 1700s, um, uh, he was writing about the guilds in England which were essentially a form of trade association. So this is when people who do the same business to get together to try to advance that business. Um, There are business trade associations where businesses who are in the same industry, like I said, get together and try to advance it. And there are professional trade associations. So there are trade associations for engineers, for example. Or, or, you know, the American Medical Association, which is a trade association for doctors. Uh So trade associations advocate for their members Uh um, and they are not government entities. Um, uh, They interact with the government uh, to try to advance the interests of their members. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that those interests are always in the best interest of consumers or in the best interest of other people. Um, for example, uh, for many years, the auto industry uh, fought against um, safer cars uh, because uh, uh, the additions were going to increase the price of the cars. Um, and uh, the same was true. They fought against um, uh, cars that, that, you know, the pollution would pollute less, you know, uh, the standards for emissions. Um, so uh, sometimes businesses in their short term interests aren't the same as the longer term interest for consumers, yeah. uh, right? And so uh, businesses have every right to advocate uh, for their interests. I'm, I'm not denying that at all. Um, and I think it's a natural thing for them to do. Um, but we would be foolish if we think that businesses advocating for their own interests are the same as consumer interests. Touching on that, because you mentioned Adam Smith, right? Uh, for people who don't know Adam Smith is, he is like the father of capitalism. <laughs> yeah, he is the father of capitalism. And um, I really like uh, his work. So since you're an expert in retail, I feel like MLM is actually an insult to capitalism. If you if we go in the perspective that capitalism works because um, it encourages competition. So when you compete, like uh, when two companies compete, usually they they compete for the consumer. Um, they either like set their prices lower than the competition, or they also like put more value on the product. So what happens, I think, in multi-level marketing is they create this deception and like false information that actually is gaming the system. I always hear in the in the business opportunity things that all you have to do is is do whatever you're doing now. Like if you're buying shampoo instead of buying shampoo from the store, you just buy from us. Like you just buy like laundry detergent from us, and that's it. And you'll become rich. Like how how absurd is that for you? Yeah, it it, it is, and the industry has gotten away with that language for far too long. Yeah. Um, they have positioned multi level marketing as a form of capitalism, oh. um, and um, I can even find you quotes where people will really be very complimentary uh, of it as a form of capitalism, and it isn't. Um, and uh, you don't have to like take my word for it. You, you just think through the model relative to what we know about capitalism. So you're exactly right. Capitalism, uh, first of all, uh, Adam Smith's uh, free market uh, uh, and competitive market structure was one to, to benefit buyers, mm-hmm. exactly. not sellers, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because he was living in a world where the sellers were in collusion with each other. These guilds and others were fixing prices, fixing the supply, and then the consumers were paying too much. So he said, well, if you really have a competitive environment, um, it's actually the the consumers who benefit from that competition. 
So uh, an MLM actually um, asks you um, to remove yourself from the marketplace and to buy only from them. And increasingly, they keep adding things to what they want to sell you. So they want more and more, bigger and bigger share of your wallet. Uh -huh. And then they attach to that something that they promote as having potentially huge value um, and you can't verify it. In other words, the business opportunity is attached to the process of you buying their products. And so when you buy their products, um, you are um, taking care of something for your household. You need shampoo, you need shampoo, right? Um, but at the same time, they're saying, but, but this is better because uh, while you're doing this and while you're encouraging others to do this, you're actually pursuing a business opportunity. You're actually pursuing an income opportunity. Of course, the reality is if we look at the distribution of income in multi-level marketing companies, it is far worse. In other words, far more unequal than the distribution of income in the economy overall. In other words, the concentration of income and wealth in an MLM company will be far more concentrated at the top than it is in the, the normal economy. So one of the things that's striking that MLM companies often say is, if you aren't making it in this general economy, if with your skills and your talents and your training and your position you're in now, you know, you um, are in a J-O-B, a job that you um, don't like, or that is, they'll often say something like, you're just above broke or about broke or whatever they, however they put it. Then they say, well, we're gonna invite you into an opportunity where you can really shine, where you can really uh, get the kind of rewards you deserve. Other people have done it, other people like you, other people with modest amounts of education or other people with modest amounts of money have done it. Yeah, we've seen them up on the stage, so you can do it too. Um, but that's actually not the reality uh, if we look at the entire big picture. If we look at the entire big picture of, and we compare, uh, trying to pursue the opportunity within the MLM to just trying to pursue a career in the world outside, what we find out is it's actually um, the far greater chance of fail, failure in the MLM, a far greater chance of having a negative financial income uh, in the MLM than it is out in the public. I've written before that if you look at some of the averages that, that we see from the data that the companies release, um, you would be um, much more uh, better off uh, uh, if you would simply um, work a few hours a week minimum wage. You know, sure, I accept the fact that when that people are all there are all ranges of people. I mean, I'm 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 a college professor. Do all of my students try real hard? No. Do they think they're trying hard? Some of them maybe, but so sure, I accept the fact that some people who get involved in MLM. Uh, uh, decide it's not from them and, and, and quit, say, within a month or two or three or four or whatever. Sure, I accept that. But the data is powerful in terms of what we see over long periods of time. And the reality is that the people who are at the top of those uplines persist year after year. So if you were to say, well, there's 1% of the people who are making half a million dollars a year, the chances of the of who is in that one percent, the chances of that changing, are very small, and so uh, so your probability of of joining that group isn't one percent. If half that group, if half that group changed every year, your probability of, of would be um, a half a percent. If 90% of that group stays the same year after year, your probability uh, is a tenth of a percent. So the reality is that there's no room at the top. Um, yes. But as long as we can keep people believing there's room at the top, they'll keep trying and they'll keep buying. Especially for, P for MLMs that are operating for decades. The only way that happened is most of the people recruited one or zero every year. That's the only probability, one or zero. <laughs> if, if you if you look yeah. at 
MLMs that have been a long time. So what happened is, so if I'm in early in an MLM uh, and it grows, um, and I'm and and I've got the connections I need, and that usually means someone who's come out of a different MLM. Uh-huh. Um, I uh, the top MLM people who are in established MLMs may have downlines in 20, 40, 50, 80 countries, uh-huh. right? So so uh-huh. they are they are deriving income um, from thousands uh, uh-huh. in their downline. Now uh, imagine. Uh, that everyone probably cannot do that. And even if we look mathematically, we know they can't do it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So so mathematically, it's not possible. Practically, it's not possible. Um, and so the message that it is possible that anybody can do this is, is just wrong. TC is giving us an opportunity uh, to share information with them. But in the end, in the end, it's our families, our communities, our friends. We're really talking about um, people we care about.